Well, good morning, Riverbend in the house. And good morning, Riverbend in 24 states, right, online. Um, it was great to hear, Chris. And I just want to say how happy I am to be here. I, I have, in the work I do, I go to different churches around the nation. So this is my first Sunday in Austin since Labor Day weekend. And I'm extremely happy to get to spend it with you all here. A couple things about that. One is, uh, speaking a lot, my voice gets a little compromised, so if I run out of it, Chris Hansen is going to finish my sermon. Um, but two is, I don't miss sermons just because I'm not in town. I, I do some of that online stuff in the states where I am, and, and so I know that we've been pretty fruity lately. We've been talking about the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, from Galatians chapter 5, and, and so you've heard a whole lot of times over, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Paul uses this image, fruit, and I happen to be from one of the fruit capital, capitals of the United States. I grew up in Northwest Oregon, where we have orchards in a lot of places, where my first job was at age 12 picking strawberries in a field outside Sheridan, Oregon, where I grew up. So I'd get up in the morning, put my sweatshirt into the dryer so it'd be warm, and I'd go out and I'd pick little strawberries, and my sister was a much better picker than I, but we'd, we, we made some money doing it, so I'm an expert on fruit and how it comes about. And so, I, this is not to disparage you, Dave, or Stephanie, or, or Travis, but I feel like I have an advantage here, and so I'm going to give you my rendition of an apple tree bearing fruit, okay? An apple tree bearing an apple. And this is a much in demand performance. I've, I've won awards, um, <laughs> so sit back and enjoy. This is an apple tree bearing an apple. No, thank you. Thank you, really. Thank you. Is that what it looks like when an apple tree bears an apple? No, they don't have to do calisthenics and push-ups and everything. They just, they just are apple trees. And so they bear apples. It's possible to get the wrong idea about these fruits that they suddenly become commands when actually they're what God makes come out of us naturally if we connect to God which is a very cool thing, and today's fruit is rather timely. Today's aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is, the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Right? Gentleness, and we happen to be in a mean time in American history. How many of you have seen a video online of somebody punching somebody on an airplane? Or getting thrown out of some restaurant because they were unruly. Everybody's got a phone, so we see these. Hate crimes are up, right, in American culture. Hate crimes are up. Nurses and teachers and pastors are fleeing their jobs because of how abusive people have gotten, how mean people have gotten. So this fruit of gentleness is actually a fairly timely thing for us to talk about. As we do, as we get to what it is and what may stand against it and how we might cultivate it and what it could do in the world, before we do all that, let's ask for help from God. So will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the first thing to do with these fruits, as you've learned along the way, these aspects of Christian fruit, of spiritual fruit, is to figure out what each one is. And this one gets translated gentleness almost in every translation. But the Greek word behind it, because I'm a geek, I'm bringing you Greek, see how that rhymes? The Greek word behind it is 
Praoutes, praoutes. And it comes from, see that little parenthetical thing? Praoutes. And, and it comes from a smaller word, praus, that simply means gentle. Have you enjoyed our little study of the word? Right? Actually, we get some help. And in, if you've got a, a handout, you've got a bunch of passages that have the word praus in it. But I'm going to major in three that show up either through Jesus' speech or through people talking about Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. The first one is probably the most famous. This happens on a, on a hillside in Galilee when Jesus is giving his very first sermon in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's the Beatitudes, the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. Beatitudes simply mean what you're blessed by. And so Jesus goes up on a hill, takes his disciples with him, and says, blessed are, and names a bunch of things that characterize blessed people. And right there in chapter 5, verse 5, is blessed are the meek. Now, what do you hear when you hear the word meek? I'm going to popcorn this, so you people who are out here, be bold. What, what does that word connotate for you? What, what sense do you get from the word meek? Timid. Humble, maybe? Others? Shy? Yeah, I think maybe it's because of its resonance with the word weak. It's, it's rhyming with the word weak. We tend to think of it as sort of this shy, timid, receding word. But it's the same word we get for gentle in chapter 5 of, uh, of Galatians. And if we keep going with it, like we do in your handout, if we keep going with it, we find out that it really couldn't be timid or passive or those things that we sometimes, we look at somebody who, who's kind of collapsed in, in their body almost, right? This is kind of timid and bashful maybe, right? But in 11, chapter 11 of Matthew, Jesus actually calls himself praus. Here's how it goes. It's a famous passage also, so you may be familiar with it. Jesus at that time declared... Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, praus, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest of your souls, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How many of you think of Jesus as a, a sort of receding, passive, timid sort? No. So we get a bit of fleshing out of this word praus when Jesus says, that's me. He raises his hand and said, I'm a praus kind of guy. And we'll get back to this, but Jesus isn't exactly a shy, retiring, uh, sort of passive person. And it shows up again in a very fascinating moment in the, in the 21st chapter of Matthew. And you've got this one under Zechariah 9.9 in your, in your handout if you want to use it. But it's on the screen. Uh, here Jesus is in that great moment on Palm Sunday when he rides into Jerusalem and everybody's putting down palm branches and waving them and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, right? So it's, a, it's kind of a regal moment for Jesus. But he's riding on a donkey and the author of the gospel, Matthew, says, I think I've seen this happen before. And he goes to Zechariah 9.9 and, and quotes it saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, praus, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So, Jesus has run the table on meekness, he's said, on gentleness. He's, he said, blessed are the gentle, the meek, which is translate, translated meek there. He has said, I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you'll get rest from me. And then Matthew has said, this guy is humble. Remember Zechariah 9.9. 9. So the three translation words I want you to think about for this word just as we start are meek, gentle, humble. Right? Meek, gentle, humble. When you combine those three words and throw in the rest of the life of Jesus, you get what this might look like. Right? Now, some of you are saying, I don't really aspire to be those things. Certainly there has been since Jesus spoke these words, 
there has been pushback on his claim that the meek are blessed, that we ought to aspire to be gentle or humble. In the first century, revolution was swirling. People wanted to throw off the powerful Roman Empire because Jews lived captive to the Roman Empire. How many of you have seen The Chosen? Okay, some of you have seen it. It's a worthwhile view, and it, it's, it's on uh, Prime. And in it, you get a sense of how prevalent the presence of Rome is in the everyday life of Jews. Many of them were tired of it. Many of them wanted the, the Messiah to overthrow the Roman government. And this gets captured in a satirical way by Monty Python. How many of you know the phrase Monty Python? Monty Python was a comic troupe in the 80s, 90s, and, and came up with some awfully uh, strange but wonderful comedy. And one of their movies is called The Life of Brian. And it happens in and around the time of Jesus and next to what Jesus is up to. So in the, in the Life of Brian is a scene from Jesus speaking the Beatitudes. And it's hilarious, right? Because these revolutionaries, the People's Judean Front, it's a revolutionary group that's competing with the Judean People's Front and others like it, right? Um, the people of that revolutionary group have gathered to listen on the edge of the crowd and they can't really hear exactly. So at one point, somebody says, I think he said, blessed are the cheesemakers, right? <laughs> instead of peacemakers, and then somebody else says, oh, I know what he means. He means the producer of all dairy products, um, right? So they're trying to interpret from half-heard things, but then it comes, I think it's blessed of the Greeks. And of course it means meek, and Reg, the leader of the revolutionaries, says, it's meek, silly, and what Jesus blatantly fails to appreciate is it's the meek who are the problem. Now, why are meek people, in the, in the sort of resonance that we had earlier, why are meek people not that exciting for revolutionaries? Well, we're kind of this way, and we're backing off, and we're submissive, and all those things. Reg thought, that's not how you win a war. It's not how you overthrow an oppressor. We don't want meek people. And his voice, comically put, has made it through the history of philosophy and politics so that in the 19th century, Karl Marx, no less a sort of leader of people than Karl Marx, uh, wrote that religion is the opiate of the masses. And here's the context. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the, the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. In other words, it makes people willing, because it's this opiate, it makes people willing to put up with harsh conditions and submit to them and gives them a religious reason to do that. The kind of Christianity or kind of religion he looked at was very meek in the way that we thought isn't a great definition. Right? Similarly, Friedrich Nietzsche, philosopher of the late 19th century in Germany, didn't like Christianity at all for this reason. He said the Christian faith from the beginning is sacrifice, the sacrifice of all freedom, the pride of all pride, of all self-confidence, of spirit, it's at the same time subjection, self-derision, and self-mutilation. If we put that on the sign outside the church, how many people would show up? <laughs> He's not exactly our best PR guy, is he? Right? Nietzsche didn't like religion, and especially Christianity, because he looked around and he thought it made weaker people. Right? And sometimes... People misread. People take what Jesus has said and go in a different direction than Jesus embodies. And the great Christian writer of England of the last century, C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, decided to take this on in his character Aslan. How many of you have seen or read C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia or Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe on a movie? Or, all right, a lot of hands going up. How many of you then recognize the name Aslan? Aslan is the Christ figure in, in Lewis's Narnia Chronicles. And in that first one, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, they enter Narnia, Lucy first and then the rest of the children, the Pevensey children, enter Narnia, and they start hearing about this Aslan. And they hear about it, by the way, from animals who can talk in Narnia, so catch up. These are talking animals. And 
and they, they finally hear some specificity from the beaver family. And here we go. They hear that Aslan is a lion, and, Lu- and Susan says, Ooh, I thought he was a man. Is he, is, he, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, you know. This is Lewis's way of saying, Jesus is not telling us when he says, blessed are the meek, when he says, I am meek and lowly of heart, when, he, when Paul writes about gentleness as a, as a fruit of the Spirit. It's not this sort of retiring, bashful, passive thing. Jesus has what we would call a gentle strength or a strong gentleness. Try to insert that as your picture because most of the critiques hit what I think is a straw man, hit a definition that snivels out of what Paul is describing and what Jesus is describing into something weaker and less. Could our world use a little strong gentleness or gentle strength right now? David Brooks, the cultural and political commentator who is Uh, according to one uh, way of describing him, every liberal's favorite conservative, but has become kind of an an elder states person for what's going on in the United States, recently wrote an article for um, for the Atlantic. He wrote it in August. And in it, he confessed that for the last five years, he's been trying to understand two things. One is, why are Americans so sad? Why have we gotten so sad? Because depression numbers are up, loneliness numbers are up, all kinds of things that don't exactly say happy are up in the indicators. And that's one of his questions. But the second one is on our, on our line today. He says, what, makes, uh, what has made Americans so mean? How did Americans get so mean? And this part of the article is the one I want to quote because he names things that embody meanness like the ones I put at the beginning of our time together. He names nurses leaving the profession. He names people getting kicked out of restaurants because they just can't be civil enough to sit and not be mean or or afraid against somebody else. All those things he puts in order. And he says, you know, there have been a lot of attempts to explain this. There's the technological explanation, which is social media has made us meaner. Now, social media gives us a, a way to be mean to one another, and I see it all the time. Yesterday, after the University of Texas won their game 35 to 6, right? A&M won also, so you who are A&M people are fine. Um, after the, I went on a fan site on, on Facebook, and the, the Longhorns had just won 35 to 6, and these two guys were just hammering on one another because they disagreed on why UT didn't win 42 to 6, right? We hammer on, on uh, social media, so that's one venue where we see it. Others have defined it sociologically, have said, well, we don't have bowling leagues anymore, we don't have bridge clubs or breakfast clubs. The way that we used to keep community are gone, and that's why we are meaner, we, we don't get to be with one another as much. And then there are some who have defined it demographically. We have a lot of different kinds of people, different races, different origins, different all kinds of things. It makes it harder to be kind to one another. And some have done it economically. We have a big uh, income gap, and it makes for all kinds of meanness. And Brooke says, yeah, all those are a, a bit the explanation, but now I'd like to slide up. If I could get this slide back up. There we go. He says what we're really missing is moral formation, moral communities, communities that actually teach us how to be good, how to be gentle in our case today. And so he says, healthy moral ecologies don't just happen. They have to be seeded and tended by people who think and talk in moral terms, who try to model and inculcate moral behavior, who understand that we have to build moral communities because on our own, we're all selfish and flawed. Moral formation is best when it's humble. It means giving people the skills and habits that will help them be considerate to others in the complex situation of life. It means helping people behave in ways that make other people feel included, seen, and respected. Friends, you are sitting 
in a former of moral ecologies. Churches have been this since Jesus walked the nation, walked the land, right? Since he walked ancient Palestine. Churches have, from their beginning, been formers of moral communities. In fact, in, uh, in 2016, when things started to get rough in the political sphere, two different guys in 2017 at Easter, two different guys, one P- Protestant, one Catholic, one, uh, one, e- one very liberal, one very conservative, two guys wrote the same article in two different places without talking to one of them. They said, uh, liberals, why don't you go back to church? You're meaner than you used to be. Right? The culture recognizes that church can be a place where we form people of gentleness and kindness and goodness. Our nation needs us. Our nation needs us to be that kind of place. And the other thing that we learn from this, quote from Brooks, is that it's not exactly like I portrayed the presentation of an apple at the beginning, is it? It's not exactly like, well, I'm a human, I'm going to produce this fruit. This is the fruit of the Spirit, and the Spirit requires connecting to God and to one another. It requires that we invest in the Spirit, that we are a part of a community. And when we are, the world will get better because the world needs us, and we need God. The world needs us, and we need God. Amen? Amen.